and uh, uh, it's really, I, I have to, you know, uh, thank the host for recognizing the importance of, of organizing a, a specialty meeting like this because uh, I think there's such fast progress being made in the field that uh, we need to have this as a regular occurrence and I hope people recognize that. Um, such enormous advances have been made in the last two decades in organizing movement ecology uh, that we, I think, lose track a little bit about uh, future directions. And a lot of the preoccupation has been with uh, deriving more sophisticated ways of, of decision analysis, resource selection, and uh, modeling movement trajectories in uh, extremely sophisticated fashion. And I think that uh, those advances are, are really profound. Uh, there's lots more to be done, of course, but I think that uh, you know, we've really advanced the, the edge considerably. What I think we haven't advanced nearly as much is the constraints and the landscapes against which those movements are, are being modeled. And uh, I think there's some serious co consequences of that in that many of the models we would like to derive are essentially adaptive models that are framed around fitness consequences. And our models have to be based in that way if they're going to be predictive, if you think about it. Purely mechanistic phenomenological models uh, don't translate very well to new circumstances. And we need predictive models of movement. So what I'm going to suggest today is really a, not a technical talk at all, but rather I'm going to concentrate on a couple of remote sensed ways of, of getting uh, insight into constraints and into uh, landscape characteristics that I think uh, have some potential to inform movement modeling. And we've used the, this a little bit uh, in uh, work that Tal Avgar talked about uh, uh, yesterday. So um, the, the system I'm talking about is, is identical. It is Woodland Caribou in, in Canada. Uh, we happen to be living in Ontario. And uh, Ontario caribou, like many uh, animals across the country, are, are uh, if not uh, critically endangered, certainly threatened, and on the long-term decline with well-established range retraction that's occurred across the province. So a uh, very high conservation priority has been tried to understand how these animals use a, an environment that's been rapidly changing. And that environment <coughs> we would like to be able to modify to uh, conserve caribou in the future. So in order to address that problem, we have been working with individually marked animals, a uh, very large number of animals across the province, but uh, animals in three uh, detailed study sites. Each of these are about uh, 25 or 30,000 square kilometers, so they're certainly not small study sites. And we're trying to learn about the fitness attributes of individuals in those herds. Uh, some, some fraction of the 140 animals that we are working with have uh, more detailed equipment uh, added in the form of accelerometers and uh, video cameras. And so we're gonna, I'm going to talk about how we can use that information to augment our understanding and then apply it against uh, the larger population. Uh, the equipment that we work with is, was designed in uh, conjunction with low tech uh, company in Canada. But really, the uh, exciting bits were added by uh, Mehdi Bakhtari, who has uh, worked for a long time with National Geographic and designed the critter cams that really kind of uh, initiated that whole scene. Now, the information that we're going to work with uh, is conventional kind of GPS collars. Um, they have uh, accelerometry added. We're not going to do whole uh, animal uh, uh, accelerometry and we're not going to look in detail, but rather we're going to work with the integrated data as a means of summing up energetic costs, essentially, as being one of the really crucial bits of information that is often missing. The cameras are also loaded with, oh, let's see, I need to find the video on here. How do I do this? I have to... Yes, so do I need to start in the corner? Well, why don't you just kick it off and I'll just talk. All right, so what I'm going to do, um, since it's not a technical talk, you don't have to look at equations, what you're going to get a chance to see is uh, the view of life from caribou. And so what we've done is done a, a best hits uh, collection of, of moments in, in the caribou life. And <clears throat> it gives you a, 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 some insight into 
how we can start to see the environment from the animal's point of view. And there's lots of little bits that go into this. Obviously, you know, being ungulates, they spend a lot of time looking for food to eat. Uh, because they live in Canada, they rarely see that above snow. So they spend a lot of time trying to dig through the snow to find the, those forage items. Uh, you know, they certainly are, are uh, moving at different speeds at different times, depending on the conditions that they face. And they're using resources that are, you know, complex in, in space and time. Furthermore, because we almost never see these animals, we don't know what resources are important to them. And so by uh, working with the imagery, we can actually score the fraction of time they're feeding on, on different food types. And in so doing, we've now kind of discovered that caribou eat, you know, upwards of, of 80 or 90 different food species <laughs> and in varying amounts depending on where they are in the environment. Uh, we also, you know, get some insight into how, the, how their activity patterns are shaped throughout the day. Monotonous uh, stretches exactly like this where they stare at the sky. Uh, but there are kind of these moments of, of, you know, terror when they're kind of doing other things too. Uh, so, you know, all these are kind of things that you never get a picture for. And for many of the species that we're interested in a conservation sense, these are animals that we know very little about their biology. And we need to get beyond just a series of fixes in space uh, lined up against a series of habitat variables that come from GIS. Uh, if we're going to do something in terms of modifying the, you know, the, the conservation needs for those kind of species. Now, a number of people have been talking about social interactions. Okay, this is essentially a solitary species, but it is transiently very social. And so for some months during the year, uh, you know, fusion, fusion kind of dynamics are a consequence of these random encounters of individuals in space. So these are kind of probabilities of occurrence that would be very difficult to uh, estimate unless you had uh, extremely high density uh, GPS information uh, like the, the baboon work we were talking about earlier. And finally, uh, reproductive events are really difficult to assess. Uh, for, our, for us, that's an important thing because the animal has uh, very limited re reproductive capacity. And so one of the things that we're, uh, you know, getting some very good information on is, is the probability of successful birth and early survival of these uh, youngsters. And uh, because they occur in close proximity, we can get some idea of, of to what degree so social cohesion is important for the survival of these young, young animals. So in, like in all kinds of behavioral work, the challenge is in working with the information. And so we have armies of volunteers that come in and watch TV. It turns out that undergraduates are actually very good at watching TV <laughs> and take great delight in it. And so, you know, uh, the list is growing every day. And, uh, you know, so I think we've hit on the perfect way to, to tap into their interests. Well, if this last scene doesn't make you sick to your stomach, I don't know what will. <laughs> All right. So apart from just the fun of, of uh, getting some, some, a picture of what the life of a caribou is like from the, from, from the animal's uh, vantage, we can now start to work a little bit to try and understand energetic costs and gains by taking that, that, those snippets of information and fitting them into a, a larger context. So... For example, we can use the video to sample behavior and you know, take several thousand slices of, of behavior at particular stretches in time. And we can match that with the accelerometry that's been integrated over those, those same time intervals to get some idea of whether the accelerometers are capable of detecting intense periods of behavior that have elevated cost. Uh, but at the same time, obviously, many of those uh, snippets had foraging uh, moments, and so we can go back and do foraging ecology at the level of the muzzle of an animal, which uh, is, as an ungulate biologist, one of the really hardest things to do is to actually see what animals are eating, and in that imagery you get a pretty good idea. All right, so in terms of accelerometry, you all know essentially what it is, but you know, we're, we're looking at, at 
patterns of acceleration in, in usually three uh, dimensions. With these collars, it turns out that they throw away the third dimension and just recorded it in two. But um, then we, uh, the data are stored or integrated as a, a value over a five minute period, and that's related, normalized to a, a maximum value. Okay, now this army of undergraduates went through and categorized each of those, those snippets of, of video uh, or a sampling of that and assigned it to a series of behavioral categories. So constructing an ethogram essentially of caribou from the TV set. And then the categories that uh, are, are uh, above are then uh, scored with respect to the accelerometry data. And it's all normalized, remember, so that the normalized data on the, on the horizontal axis, the vertical axis, indicates the proportion of time in, in uh, these, these uh, uh, standardized behavior types. And you can now see kind of consistency in the, the shading, uh, you know, suggesting that you know, when you have animals that have very low uh, activity scores from uh, the, the accelerometry, that essentially those are animals that are standing uh, laying down, ruminating, essentially very inactive in those two, two spatial dimensions. At the other end of the spectrum, animals that are belting across a, a roadway, swimming across uh, water, very actively foraging or engaged in social mo uh, interactions, are at the far right hand of the scale and have much higher uh, activity scores. So one very interesting area uh, that we started to explore is to see to what degree we can actually predict the likelihood of behaviors on the basis of the accelerometry, right? A reverse regression kind of approach. And uh, to some degree, I think you can, even with these extremely coarse measures, uh, certainly we can discriminate uh, running without even thinking about a kind of statistical test. You can discriminate the very high activity uh, behaviors. But even uh, differentiating walking from standing and, and static behavior uh, turns out that uh, we have enough information to do that, uh, which we've done essentially uh, using a regression tree design, basically, to see to what degree we can partition those moments. And when we do that, then we get essentially a 78% accuracy in assigning to those rough categories. So as long as you're not interested in, in explaining you know, 30 types of behavior, the accelerometry uh, alone, uh, without doing any kind of sophisticated uh, assignment to, to a movement phase, for example, would be capable of, of differentiating a large fraction of the, those behaviors, which is encouraging. Uh, by the same token, many of these behaviors have been uh, measured in, in physiological terms for, for uh, physiological costs because of work done at the University of uh, Alaska, who have had some very detailed kind of uh, experimentation with captive animals over the years. And so we have information on the cost per unit time for uh, most of these behavior types. And when we assign those, then we now have a measure of the energetic cost per unit time for low versus high levels of, of accelerometry measured activity uh, that relates back to these behaviors. So we now have kind of a means of evaluating what the behaviors are. We have a means of evaluating what the cost might be associated with those behaviors. And you'll notice that the costs of energetic costs here are scaling kind of two to threefold, which is about what you'd expect, uh, you know, from extremely sedentary to extremely active animals. All right. Well, the other side of the equation is we also would like to know what the positive uh, energetic availability is in the landscape, and so we assemble large teams of people to go out and uh, and get on their hands and knees to count resources in the forest. This is a rare moment of of joy. And when they're on their hands and knees, they uh, measure biomass of the 80-odd different things that, uh, that the caribou are eating, which we know from the videos. And then we can build up a picture of the diet of, of caribou over time. And uh, not only the diet or the proportion, we can, with uh, appropriate kind of laboratory studies, turn that into an energy. Uh, so we have a pretty good idea of what the energetic gain is for animals foraging in particular patches. We have a pretty good idea of the energetic cost of what it takes to feed in those patches. And that's really the underlying information that, that Tal was talking about in his talk yesterday, where he was talking about um, you know, the, the landscapes uh, that uh, caribou are, are uh, moving in. All right, well, from here on in, 
what we clearly want to do is we want to kind of apply that in a landscape setting. And so what essentially we're doing is we're whoops, trying to build uh, energetic landscapes, both in, both in terms of cost and, and gain, uh, by taking the usual kind of GIS information, but now coloring those maps with energetic values that uh, allow us to think about places that have high energetic yield versus places that might be sinks in terms of energy. And we think that that uh, can give us some ability to better model the, the uh, trajectories of animals. And uh, those trajectories, in turn, can be embedded into spatially explicit models of, of population viability, where the fitness of individual animals in the simulation is colored by the trajectory that they uh, use as they cross this landscape. And intervals of, of uh, in, Periods in, in, the, in the source areas versus the sink areas energetically translate into high fitness, uh, and that becomes now a, a landscape source of stochasticity and population viability analysis. So um, certainly by this time next year, that would be what my talk would be, would be to kind of bring you the bottom line. Uh, thanks a lot for your time. Happy to answer any questions. <laughs>
is storage of information. And so that's why we work with an integrated measure over, uh, you know, over a 10 second period that, that scores. But the point is that that integrated information still yields some insight that's, that makes sense against, uh, that's interpretable as a cost. So it's a trade off. We've, we have done it though with um, captive animals second by second in a zoo setting, so, which is kind of closer to what you're talking about, I guess. Anyways, thank you very much.